The subject we're looking at now is entitled Sun versus Sun, the Evolution Debate. Sun, S-O-N versus Sun, S-U-N, the Evolution Debate. We've seen over the last couple of lectures how the devil has found a way to utilize sun worship throughout history from the time of Ezekiel right through to today to get people to channel worship through to him rather than through to Yahweh. We've seen how you can either face Yahweh in the west or you can turn your back as it is in Ezekiel and face the sun and worship the sun. Sun versus sun, the evolution debate. Why not the creation debate? Well, unlike many scholars would like us to believe, the evolution theory is exactly that, a still a theory. Jean de la Bruyere said something very interesting. He says, the exact contrary of what is generally believed is often the truth. And when we look at this statement made in the Bible about all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of a fornication, and all nations bow down to the beast. The whole world follows the beast. This means that all nations, all perspectives, and all people involved will somehow be associated with sun worship. And that's, of course, as we've explained and as we've shown, whether you're aware of it or not. Now let's go back to that pie graph from adherence.com that explained who was involved with which religion according to the uh, pie graph of humanity. And we saw that 33% were Christians, 21% were Islam or Muslims, and then the 16% piece of the pie that are called non-religious, that is either agnostic, atheist, secular, humanist, etc., or people that don't have any specific affiliation to God. Remember Revelation 12 verse 9 says, the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world? Well, that has to include that portion of that 16% as well. And this lecture is specifically aimed not only into the rest of religions, but into this group of 16%. How will Satan get these people to channel sun worship or to channel worship through to him? Der Spiegel had on their front magazine this image of Gott gegen Darwin, God against Darwin. This battle or this pull of ideas, either it was creationism and literal six-day creation, or it was this long time period the, where over a period of time certain naturalistic, naturalistic things had taken place that we have evolved to a more superior plane than what we used to be. It's interesting how in that image, Gott gegen Darwin on der Spiegel, it's the snake who is in the middle with Darwin. And they are referring back to the time of Eden. And we look into that. I want to stop immediately and say something which I have to admit up front. I'm not a professor of evolution. I'm certainly not a professor of paleontology, geology, or any other natural science. When speaking on this subject, I don't have the authority to make any scientific statement or any uh, doctrinal statement regarding evolution as such. Or creation for that matter. I can only go by what the Bible says. So in that case, if I can't say anything, we have to let the Bible speak for the Bible, and we have to let the evolutionists speak for the evolutionists. I will therefore not be saying anything throughout this lecture, but I will be quoting from people and sources who can. Let's start off by looking at the three pillars of thought, or the three columns of thought. The first is the idea of creation. The second would be theistic evolution, and the third would be evolution. The first is a God-centered view where creation happens through the power of the spoken word of God. Theistic evolution is the idea, it's an evolution-centered view where God used evolution to create everything that we see. Evolution, however, is the opposite of creation. It is the atheistic view that there is no God and everything has evolved over time 
through a process of natural selection, through a process of certain natural occurrences. The first column is based on the idea that, and God said, and boom, it happened. The idea of the second column would be, and God used, over a period of time, this to generate into that, to evolve into this. The third, uh, the third column of thought would be based on the idea of saying, and I say that through natural selection the following has happened. The first column of thought, God is almighty. He speaks and boom, it exists. The second column of thought, God is not almighty in the sense that he can't click his fingers. He uses long periods of time. And the third one is, well, God doesn't actually exist at all. And this is why it's the atheistic evolution, the, the um, I'd say clinical evolution admits or points towards no deity at all. So these are the three pillars we need to look at. Creation in six literal days, theistic evolution where God used long periods of time, or evolution where there is no God. Let's start off in this middle column, theistic evolution, the idea that God used long periods of time. This is the idea that most people have today of what happened, especially amongst Christians. This is the column that most people or most Christians believe in. So let's deal with this first. Creation over long periods of time, making the starting dates and the days in Genesis not literal. This is a marriage of the thinking of, obviously, evolution and creation. It is a compromised version of the creation story in the Bible, where an, uh, a logical human experience or a logical human idea is used to explain an illogical biblical occurrence. Most Christians, in order to understand this, have to manipulate the Genesis story to fit into the story of evolution. And this is sometimes called the gap theory or it's called the, the age theory because day one was not a literal 24 hours. It was more an age or a period of time. And there were long gaps between day one and day two. In an attempt to marry evolution with creation, this idea of being able to do that stems again from not identifying the Antichrist. By not identifying the Antichrist, uh, people get involved in, in false doctrines and doctrines of devils, as the Bible calls it. Can you remember what his agenda was, the Antichrist beast? Well, it is to lead people into different forms of sun worship. You'll remember the Baal Hadad that we've described over and over, the form of sun worship, the reincarnative process of every time evolving to a new level of existence, every time the sun would die in the womb, in the semicircle, the crescent moon, or in the sea it would die and resurrect. The idea also is the foundation on, of or for a reincarnation, the process of every time your soul coming back into your body that you've evolved to a higher karma. In ancient times, even in ancient Egypt, you have the all-seeing eye with this crescent moon with the sun. These are different forms of worship, of sun worship. And the papacy holding up the Eucharist puts the Eucharist inside this sun emblem called the monstrance. And it fulfills that exact process of the circle or the sun, the star inside this crescent moon. By holding up this sun symbol, the papacy is able to get reverent Roman Catholics and in the end Christians to bow down to sun worship. But how does it work in accordance with the rest of this agnostic, the uh, people that believe in evolution? And how does it infiltrate into theistic evolution? Well, do you remember what the, what the reason was that we go to church on Sundays as Christians? Webster's International Dictionary tells us that Sunday is so called because this was the day that was anciently dedicated to the sun or its worship. And the Catholic record told us that Sunday is the Roman Catholic Church's mark of authority, that the church is above the Bible. And transference of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday is proof of that fact that they are more powerful than the Bible. Do you remember that we looked at you can either face east or, or at least you can either face west and acknowledge Yahweh in the seat 
of the, of the Almighty, the throne of God, where he says in Ezekiel, Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. Or you can turn your back on the throne of God. You can face east. You can get, be involved in sun worship as a Christian now and say, well, Sunday is our mark of authority. And this is the proof that we're bowing down to the authority and the power of the Roman Catholic system. Clive Cookson said in the Financial Times in December 23 or the 23rd of December 2005, he said, the Vatican, which often appeared ambivalent in the past, has recently gone out of its way to affirm the compatibility of the evolutionary science with the Bible. He has a statement in the Financial Times that the Vatican is somehow trying to see if they can fit evolution into the Genesis story. Again, from the Sunday Times, the graphic that says, Genesis is nonsense. The Catholic Church has officially debunked a literal interpretation of the creation according to Genesis as utter nonsense. Time magazine said, Vatican thinking evolves. This was the moment when John Paul claimed to accept the idea that evolution was a scientific process that had been proven and that was a fulfillment of the Genesis story and that Genesis was nonsense. A bit later in time, Pope Benedict has said, well, no, it's not really true. Uh, evolution is not fact. Creation is true. But however, by saying that, he's made the Christians feel comfortable by saying evolution. Well, we're going to have another look at this. But if you read carefully between the lines, what he's doing is he's saying neither is creation in its six-day, seven-day format accurate. Neither is evolution in its atheistic, non-godlike appearance accurate. But this idea of combining the two in this theistic evolution, that is true. And the USA Today explained on the 9th of June 2006, Staff and Wire reports that the Pope's evolution seminar is to be published. This is in 2006. Catholic theologians see no contradiction between their belief in the divine creation and the scientific theory of evolution. The coming together of the evolution thinking with the creation thinking into this theistic evolution. There is no argument between creation and evolution. This is what is being brought across. Kenneth Miller, he wrote this interesting book, Finding Darwin's God. He asked the question, well, who is Darwin's God? Is there a God of creation? Is there some theistic evolution? He says Catholic theology has no fight with Darwin. Biological evolution fits neatly into traditional Catholic understanding of how contingent natural processes can be seen as part of God's plan. You see, with, when the Catholic Church stands up and makes a statement or takes a stance, the rest of Christianity pretty much follows. And because the Catholic Church is saying, well, there's no argument, there is a combination of the creation story with the evolution story. Because of that stance, we now can see why the rest of Christianity believes the way it does. This graphic from Catholic Apologetics International shows a very interesting or hints towards a very interesting site. Can you see what's hiding behind the top of the steeple? Well, it reads, as the catechism says, scientific studies of the age of the, and development of the cosmos, the development of life forms and the appearance of man invite us to a, even greater admiration for the greatness of the creator. You see, this is when this lie starts to become interpreted into something which is even more deceptive. There's this argument that somehow evolution proves the greatness of our creator, that it gives a clearer picture, that the evolutionary process, the theistic evolution, gives a clearer uh, uh, idea for us of the power that is God. Somehow over time, being able to see how God has turned and changed things from one type to the other type allows us to understand the power of God or even be more impressed by it that is but I'd like to ask you think about this for a moment we have a production plant for a certain vehicle call it a Mercedes-Benz and inside or in into the one side of this production plant come a whole lot of items 
you have an engine, you have a couple of wheels, you have a rim, you have a hubcap, you have a couple of seats. They're all being pulled into the production plant on the one side. And if you were to look inside the production plant, as this uh, belt moved along, so things would be added and added and added and added and added. And then out the other side would eventually come a Mercedes-Benz. Now that's a pretty impressive thing to do, to take various separate items and over a period of time create a Mercedes-Benz. My question to you is, which one's more impressive? A production line where you can see what's going in, you can see what's happening, and you can see what's coming out over a period of time? Or somebody walking in and saying, watch this. Bah! Boom! You have a Mercedes. Which is more impressive? This uh, production line facility or somebody that says, boom, Mercedes. Boom, Mercedes. Boom, Mercedes. Don't ever let anybody tell you it's more impressive to look in evolution to see the greatness of God. That is a satanic lie. That is trying to pull away the true power of God being able to say, let the following happen and boom, it is done. So who is the creator of creation? Many people think, well, God created. Well, who's the creator of creation? That's always an interesting question. Let's look in John 1, verse 1 to 3 and verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him. John 1 verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. Ephesians 3 verse 9 says, To make all men see God who created all things, how? By Jesus Christ. Who's the creator of creation? Jesus Christ. Interestingly enough, in John 8 verse 12, he says, I am the light of the world. He repeats this in John 6.33. It says, And he, being Jesus Christ, giveth life unto the world. So here, Jesus Christ says, I am the light of the world, and I, he, giveth life. He is the creative power. He is the light of creation. Question two, who is the creator of evolution? Well, I can't tell you. Just like the Bible told us who the creation, the God of creation was, so we have to ask the evolutionists who the God of evolution is. This is from a natural history museum in the UK. It says, where did life begin? Scientists think that the likely energy source for the reactions that led to the creation of life was the sun. This implies, or implies at least, that organisms originated in surface waters and that the earliest life forms relied on photosynthesis, whereby energy from the sun converts atmospheric carbon dioxide into sugars and carbohydrates releasing oxygen. Let's read another site. Let's read another example. This is from Freeman Dyson, Science and Theology News. He says, The earth provided chemical and environmental diversity for life to explore. The sun, however, provided physical stability, a steady input of energy on which life could rely. The combination of the earth's variability with the sun's constancy provided the conditions in which life could evolve and prosper. So who is the life giver or the creator of evolution? It's the sun. And if you go now back to the critical element of the Old Testament and you have a look at the sanctuary, there were two options. Either you faced the sun, S-O-N, in the west and you bowed down to the Shekinah glory, Yahweh, the throne of God, or you faced the sun, S-U-N, and you bowed down with your back towards the Shekinah glory and you bowed down towards the east. With evolution, it's exactly the same. The Bible says, I am the light of the world. I giveth life unto the world. That is the light that giveth life. Here's another belief where you can turn your back on that one and you can face this way and you can say, no, 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 no. I am the life. I am the light that giveth life. I am the life force that fulfills evolution. It's the same fight as it was in the Old Testament. This is just a different marketing plan of Lucifer to get hold of another section of the community, those agnostics that aren't automatically going to bow down somehow to sun worship while well, he gets them through the theory of evolution. 
I'm not quite sure how to understand this theological stance taken by the Catholic Church that there's no difference between the Genesis story and evolution, that theistic evolution is possible, because theistic evolution contradicts the Bible. You just have to look into the creation story and you'll see that creation says that man brought death into the world. Man brought death. An example of this is in Romans 5. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Another example, 1 Corinthians 15, 12. For since by man came death. So according to the word of God, according to the creation story, man brought death into the world. Evolution says the opposite. In occult fashion, they take like they take the cross, they turn it upside down. Evolution says, no, 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 no. Death brought man into the world. This is directly out of National Geographic 2006. All of this is brand new information. This is not from the 1400s. This is brand new. It says, the basic idea of evolution is so elegant, so beautiful, so simple. The idea is simply that you fiddle around and you change something and then you ask, does it improve my survival or not? And if it doesn't, then those individuals die and the idea goes away. So what is the key element of being able to evolve to the next level? Well, here they say the idea is simply that, simply that you fiddle around with something and you change something. I'm still trying to figure out who the you is in the sentence because it happened by natural selection, supposedly. But anyway, even if that's the case and we accept this contradiction, this fiddling around has to improve the survival and if it doesn't, that person dies or that being dies, the plant dies and therefore it's death that will bring about the evolution of everything on earth, including mankind. So the Bible says man brought death in. The evolution says no, 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 no. Turn your back on that. Turn around. Face another truth. Death brought man into the world. Theistic evolution also contradicts the, contradicts the Bible in the sense that God knew that Satan would attempt to get humanity to worship the Son, and I'm going to give you those text words at the end of this lecture. He knew that he would somehow, Satan would somehow get us to twist towards sun worship. So in order to make sure that the creation story and evolution are not compatible, he turned the creation story upside down. Look at this with me. In Genesis 1 verse 3 to 5 it says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Boom, a Mercedes. And God said, or, and God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Question, which light was this that God created? He says, let there be light and there was light. Which light was this? Was this the sun? No, the sun was created later. Can you remember where? Well, on the third day, God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And then what happened on the fourth day? God, great, God made two great lights, one to rule over the day and one to rule over the night. And that was the fourth day. So God, being the light of the world, being the energy that gives life to creation, he takes his power and he hands a portion of his power over to the sun. And on the fourth day only, he says, boom, here, you look after that portion of my responsibility. And yet throughout history, people have bowed down in worshipful reverence to the sun, not realizing that the sun is only fulfilling that much of Jesus' ultimate power. Not only did he give a portion of his responsibility over to the sun, without the sun... Plants and plant life and animal life cannot survive. And that's why where evolution says, no, 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 the plants came after the sun, the sun was there, and out of the evolutionary power given from the sun, plants have evolved. Here the Lord says, no, I create plants on the third day, and I'll create the sun on the fourth day to prove to you that evolution and, and uh, creation are not, are not compatible. They contradict one another. You see, according to the theory of evolution, land animals developed prior to sea animals. 
the supposed plasmatic type soup that came from the, the, the rain over all the millennia, from there developed some sort of animal that climbed out of the water, developed into some mammal and climbed back into the sea. And then the sea was inhabited by land animals as they bo- moved back in. Well, the Lord again did not see that this would be possible. And he again realized that man would somehow twist the truth of creation into a lie. And he, he, he turned this whole thing upside down so that if you do any diligent study on it, you'll realize that these two cannot be married. Genesis 1 verse 21 says, And God created great whales and every living creature. And then which day was that? The fifth day. Well, in Genesis 1, 24 to 31, he then says, let the, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast. So according to evolution, which came first? The land animals, which then migrated back to the sea. And therefore the vestigial organs on a whale are proof of them having had some other existence. Well, the creation, in, in the creation story, God says, no, 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 no. I first made the whales, boom, whale, oh, isn't that beautiful? He says, oh, and look at that, boom, there's some cattle, boom, there's some sheep. And he turns this whole story of creation into the truth that it is, which evolution has to, in its pure fashion, turn it around to make it into a lie. There's only three options. Either it's literal six-day creation, Either it's a theistic sort of marrying of these two concepts into some long age process of creation or it is pure evolution where there is no God and it's a completely naturalistic process. Well, just by the examples that we've given now, the the godly creative process, in other words, theistic evolution doesn't exist. It's a mutilation of God's word. There's no way that you could somehow find ages and squeeze them in and turn this process upside down. It's a big lie. Theistic evolution is a big lie. So there's only two options left. Either it's six-day creation, bomb, or it's a long period of time evolving process where there is no God. Either God did it or God didn't do it. Those are the only two options. So... Where this one is instant, boom, there's your Mercedes, and boom, there's your cow, and boom, there's your whale. This one with this prolonged atheistic evolution, this one has to be questioned. So let's start off and say, well, let's have a look at this argument in its totality. Is the argument really about evolution or not? Is the argument really about creation or not? Is there even worth the the energy of having a debate well if you clinically look at it have a look at this for a moment you'll see that the fight is not evolution over long periods of time versus creation over long periods of time the fight is over creation in an instant boom versus evolution over long periods of time that's the real fight the fight is not about creation evolution the fight is about what The fight is about time. Either it was this or it was that. That's the real fight. Who's the God of time? Can you remember? Who was the seventh day named after according to the Saxon gods? It was the God of time. The argument between evolution and creation has got nothing to do with creation or evolution. It's got to do with did it happen boom or did it happen like that? Where did the the theory of evolution originate? Do you have any idea? Well, again, we've got to go back into the Bible and have a look. It all starts as it showed on Der Spiegel, on that magazine, with Gott gegen Darwin, with Adam and Eve, with Darwin in the middle and the snake around the tree. That's where it started. Genesis 3, verses 1 to 5. It says the following. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, Hath God said ye shall not eat of every tree? Has he been so horrible that he's hiding something from you somehow? Is he withholding some sort of information? Has God really said that? It continues. And the serpent said unto the woman, For ye shall not surely die, ye shall become as gods. This is where Satan puts his own theology on the table and he says, no, no, no. What happens when you die is you don't really die. You have this element that goes somewhere. And then through a process, you are are moving towards Godhood and even possibly the Godhead. 
this graphic shows, and this is from an evolutionary uh, perspective, from the Big Bang, which is now um, on this graphic is estimated to be about 4.6 billion years ago, from there, time has sort of spiraled up to where we are today. Through the Cambrian period, and you've got the Mississippian period, the Pennsylvanian period, the Triassic period, the Jurassic period. This is the period that inspired this Jurassic Park that we see on TV and in the movie theaters. Around the Cretaceous period, the Mesozoic era, 65 million years, 57 million years, 35 million years, and down, 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 down to where we are today. Can you see how this spiral has taken us from being nothing, in other words, the Big Bang, where they tell you that everything in the universe was compressed into a dot that is smaller than the dot on a page. So basically, nothing exploded and created everything. And over time, it's spiraled through time and evolved to where we are today. Well, this is the theory that is taught by Freemasonry. Manly Palmer Hall, who's a 33rd degree Freemason, he says, man is a god in the making. This is from his book, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry. Remember that J.D. Buck explained the same thing. He says, it is far import, more important that men should strive to become Christ than they should believe that Jesus was Christ. This idea that you can evolve to a higher plane, either through the New Age thinking of evolving to a higher karma, or that through process of reincarnation or somehow God is twisting up this, this evolutionary heat that you are growing to something greater. This comes from the Jesuit thinking. And this is displayed on the Vatican's own website. Go there. There's the, the entire URL. Go have a look for yourself. Vatican.va. Under 460 it says, For the Son of God became man so that we might become God, wanting to make us sharers in his divinity, he assumed our nature so that he made man, might make men gods. This is a, is a fulfillment of the lie in the Garden of Eden. This is taking, no, no, you won't surely die. You shall be as gods. Well, here the Catholic Church themselves is saying it. Well, God was made man so that he can make us gods. And it's this idea that was somehow implanted into Darwin, Charles Darwin, as I'll get to now. When I say implanted, I'm not saying that for just out of the corner of my mouth. I'll give you the proof just now. Charles Darwin, he wrote this fantastic book, this book, The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. And I cover up the bottom portion of it for a reason. I'll show you what it says a bit later. When I say this is a fantastic book, it's fantastic because I look into the world and I see how this book has taken the world by storm. Darwin said from his autobiography in the subheading of religious beliefs, he said the following. During these two years, March 1837 to January 1839, I was led to think much about religion. I had gradually come by this time to see the Old Testament from its manifestly false history of the world with the Tower of Babel, the rainbow as a sign, etc., etc., and was no more to be trusted than the beliefs of any barbarian. Thus belief cre crept over me at a very slow rate, but was at last complete. The rate was so slow I felt no distress. The rate at which some satanic thinking comes over you will never cause you any distress. It will always put you at ease that you are somehow growing in your knowledge and your understanding. So from a man who was studying to be a member of the church or a pastor, a leader of the church, a priest of sorts, he came to say that the Old Testament is manifestly false and the Tower of Babel, a rainbow is a sign, that's all a lie. And not only was it, was a, not only was it a lie, that it was a belief that can be held by any barbarian. Well, most people think that the evolution debate is a relatively new idea and it's been started by Charles Darwin, but this is not the case. It's been here for a long, long, long time. Pagan religions, they even worship the sun. And for pagans, the sun has always been the god or the life giver, their creator. It pointed to the power of reincarnation and the power of immortality, the immortality of the soul. Of the soul. This is why... The Baal Hadad, which was, was worshipped in this image, as you can see, which we've used over and over, is the core power inside the pagan religions of sun worship. Again, with the star within the semicircle. Well, 
if it belonged in the pagan religious era and the religions of, of paganism, then that's sort of leaning towards the belief that evolution might be a religion. Is this possible? Evolutionists always claim that intelligent design is somehow a religion and it shouldn't be taught in our schools. Well, it's quite a fact about evolution being a religion, but I'm not allowed to say that. So let's ask them. This is M. Ruse. He wrote in the book, How Evolution Became a Religion. Creationists, correct? Question mark. He says the following. Evolution is promoted by its practitioners as more than mere science. Evolution is promulgated as an ideology, a secular religion, a fully-fledged alternative to Christianity with meaning and morality. I am an ardent evolutionist and an ex-Christian, but I must admit that in this one complaint, the literalists are absolutely right. Evolution is a religion. This was true of evolution in the beginning, and it is true of evolution still today. An evolutionist saying, you've got to have the belief the same as what you would have in creation, you've got to have the same type of belief in evolution for it to be fact. You see, what they don't teach people is that there are different types of evolution. Evolution is this all-encompassing word to somehow incorporate everything from stellar uh, and planetary development through to how your dog turned into a zebra. The various types of evolution can be split up as follows. Firstly, there's cosmic evolution. This is the origin of time, space, and matter. This supposedly would have happened in the Big Bang. Has this ever been measured or seen anywhere in the world? No, it hasn't. So there's no scientific me measurement of it. The second type of evolution we have to look at is called chemical evolution. This uh, is a, the type of origin where, well, one type of, of element will originate and then will somehow grow into something else. So hydrogen will somehow develop into gold and hydrogen will somehow develop into methane, etc., etc. All the elements higher than hydrogen. Has this ever been seen or measured in history? No. The third type of evolution which you get is stellar and planetary evolution. This is the, the starting idea or the, the origin of the stars and the planets. Have we ever seen or been able to measure or detect stars being born? No. Have we ever seen planets being born? No. What we have seen is uh, what's called novas or big stars exploding. And when they're super big, they're called supernovas. This is the death of a star. That we've seen. That we see quite regularly. But the birth of a star, birth of a planet, never been seen or never been measured. What about the fourth example, organic evolution? This is the origin of life, where one type of, of life source can grow into a banana tree and that then can grow into a granadilla tree and somehow this can evolve into some sort of uh, either animal or, or human being, that over time one form of animal has developed into a different form of animal, that, that the apes have become human and that zebras have become monkeys or whatever that is. This idea of this evolving, this rotating uh, thought of one different type becoming another different type. Has that ever been seen? No, it's never been seen. It's never been measured. What about the fifth type of evolution? It's called macroevolution. This is including not only the origin of life, this is the changing from one life source to another. Where organic evolution is the origin of life coming from antimatter or coming from a rock into life coming to life. A macroevolution takes that life source and then transfers it along this evolutionary path and creates everything, including mankind. These are five elements which are embedded inside that big word of evolution, which nobody tells us are all separate things that nobody's ever seen before. There's a sixth one, though, and it's called microevolution. I believe that that's the wrong name for it. I believe that should be called variations. That one we have seen. That's the only one that's been measured. That means that you can take various different types of dog and you can breed them and create another type of dog. I, over time, can take a small dog and can grow and grow and grow into a bull master for a, or some Siberian, one of these big Newfoundlanders, or even into a Great Dane. Over time, I can then change the variance of the expression of the genes down into a chihuahua. 
I'm not quite sure why I'd want to do that. But anyway, the interesting part is I started with a dog and I end up with a, a dog. So it doesn't start off with a dog and end up with a sheep. Or I don't start with a banana and end up with a rugby ball. The one kind will follow on to the other kind, but inside the genes, God has put certain blockages in place where one kind can only produce after its own kind, and that's biblical. We've, we've only been able to identify, measure, and scientifically test and prove one of those, and that's number six. From number one through to number five of those different types of evolution, they're religious because there's no proof of them. And in order for something to have to be true, you have to take it on faith. So five out of six of the points based that are, are fundamental to the belief in evolution are religious. And that's why Louis T. Moore says that in his book, The, the Dogma of Evolution, the more one studies paleontology, the more certain one becomes that evolution is based on faith alone. Exactly the same sort of faith which it, is, which it is necessary to have when one encounters the great mysteries of religion. This is confirmed in Wolfgang Smith in his The Universe is Ultimately to be Explained in Terms of a Metacosmic Reality. This long title for this book, here's an excerpt. It says, I'm convinced moreover that Darwinism in whatever form is not in fact a scientific theory. In reality, the theory derives its support not from empirical data or logical deductions of a scientific kind, but from the circumstance that it happens to be the only doctrine of biological origins that can be conceived with a constricted worldview to which a majority of science no scientists no doubt subscribe. So there's a group of scientists that have their, their certain blindfolders on and they can only see in that direction. And this theory is the only one that fits in to that area of their belief. Many evolutionists, I believe, have absolutely sincere intentions, just like with my Muslim friends and my Hindu friends and my Christian friends. People are doing the best that they can do, and Satan is deceiving them. Evolutionists in general just want to study and know more about the world and its origins. Satan doesn't care about what you care for and what you don't care for. He, he doesn't he doesn't care what you think. He's deceiving the whole world into bowing down into sun worship. And just like uh, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky said, Lucifer is the Logos, the serpent, and the savior. Lucifer represents life, thought, progress, civilization, liberty, and independence. This is from her book, The Secret Doctrine. She also said, it is Satan who is the God of our planet and the only God. And Lucifer, now listen, is divine and terrestrial light, the Holy Ghost and Satan at one at the same time. He is the good and the bad. He is the male and the female. He is the right eye and the left eye. He is the po pentacle, po a pentagram pointing up. He's the pentagram pointing down. She continues, she says in The Secret Doctrine on page 415, once that the key to Genesis, that's in Genesis in the Bible, once that the key to Genesis is in our hands, it is the scientific and symbolical Kabbalah which unveils the secret. The great serpent of the Garden of Eden and the Lord God are identical. And so are Jehovah and Cain one. That Cain who is referred to in theology as the murderer and the liar to God. These short and seemingly contradictory statements are in the Old Testament, as, as laid out in the Old Testament, are the secret doctrine. So where uh, uh, Albert Pike at the head of Freemasonry says Lucifer is our God and you've got Helena Petrovna Blavatsky who at the top of the Theosophical Society says Lucifer is the Logos, the serpent, the savior. She now says, well, God, just like we've shown, the right eye, the left eye, the male, the female, the good, the evil, the, the Lord and the serpent in the Garden of, of Eden, they're identical, they're the same thing. Jehovah and Cain are one. This is the secret doctrine. Well, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky said something even more. She said, the word evolution is the best word from a theosophical standpoint to use in the treating of the genesis of men and things. 
as the process which it designates is that which has always been stated in the ancient books from whose perusal the tenets of wisdom religion can be gathered. The basis of the theosophical system is evolution. Now if the house of theosophy says Lucifer is the serpent, the logos, the savior, then I don't want to do anything. I don't want to have anything to do with that. And if she says that this is the basis of the theosophical system, well then, boy, I've got a question where my allegiance is. Again, it's only a few illuminated insiders, these ones that have received supposedly this light as a sage or an adept that know that these satanic teachings are the basis of evolution. Blavatsky said even more on the subject, she, everything she believes is focused and based on this idea that evolution is the foundation for what she believes. She said in, in uh, her pages on page 557 to 562, light is the great protein magician and under the divine will of the architect, its multifarious omnipotent waves gave birth to every form as well as to every living being. So it was the light or the sun that gave birth to everything. She continues, from its swelling electric bosom sprang matter and spirit. Within its beams the lie the beginnings of all physical and chemical action and all cosmic and spiritual phenomena. It vitalizes and disorganizes. It gives life and produces death. And from its primordial point gradually emerged into existence the myriads of worlds, visible and invisible celestial bodies. She says in Secret Doctrine, the tradition of the dragon and the sun is echoed in every part of the world. There was a time when the four parts of the world were covered with temples sacred to the sun and to the dragon. But the cult is now preserved mostly in China and the Buddhist countries. Who is the founder of the theosophical movement saying is the Logos? Lucifer. She then says, it is the sun that is the primordial energy that gave life to this planet, everything physical and non-physical. Scientists are looking all over the world to try and fill up this limited worldview about what they need to find, the proof to prove that evolution is fact. They are searching for evidence to prove a, a process that doesn't exist. They are searching for evidence to prove something that is governed by the sun god. The hungry scientists, what are they hungry for? They are hungry for what's called intermediate fossils. But just as the sun god doesn't exist in reality, intermediate fossils don't exist as reality. It's one of the most painful things to have to admit. P.G. Williamson said, A persistent problem in evolutionary biology has been the absence of intermediate forms in the fossil record. Typically, the record consists of successive ancestor-descendant lineages morphologically invariant through time and unconnected by intermediates. Charles Darwin himself said, the number of intermediate varieties which have formed existed must truly be enormous. Why then is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology surely does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. And this perhaps is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against the theory. You see, the idea is, if I'm going from A to Z, how many letters in the alphabet do I have between A and Z? Well, I've got a whole bunch. I've got B, C, D, E, F, G, etc., etc., etc. What we're finding in the fossil record is A and Z. So if there are literally millions and millions and millions of A's and Z's, in relation to A versus Z and all the bits in between, how many bits in between should there be and how many end bits should there be? There should be many, many, many more intermediates than what there are actual fossils. But Darwin himself says, this is probably the biggest problem we have. We can't find this multitude that should be in the geological strata. We cannot find it. Jeffrey H. Schwartz also said, given that evolution, according to Darwin, was in a continual state of motion, it followed logically that the, rec the fossil record should be rife with examples of transitional forms leading from one less to more evolved. 
instead of filling the gaps in the fossil record with so-called missing links, most paleontologists found themselves facing a situation in which there were only gaps in the fossil record with no evidence of transformational intermediates between documented fossil species. And then Stephen Jay Gould, who is one of the most celebrated agnostic or, or uh, atheistic evolutionists of all time, he was an American paleontologist. He was an evolutionary biologist and he was a historian of science. He was also one of the most influential and widely read writers of popular science of his generation, leading many commentators to call him America's unofficial evolutionary laureate. He said the following. Interestingly enough, two years after Stephen Gould, or it is written about him that, interestingly enough, two years after Stephen Gould and Niles Edridge admitted in 1980 that they couldn't find any evidence of intermediate fossils to support the evolutionary theory, the Pontifical Academy of Science said that evidence for evolution was beyond dispute. Be beyond dispute? Well, I, dispu I dispute that it's beyond dispute. Nothing's been proven. They haven't found anything. The Australian molecular biologist said the evolutionary theory is still as it was in Darwin's time, and this is written in 1986, a highly speculative hypothesis entirely without directional factual support and very far from that self-evident axiom some of its more aggressive advocates would have us believe. There's this idea that evolution is fact. No, it's called the evolution theory for a reason. It is still a theory. And just like you have to have faith to believe in a six, literal six-day creation, boom, that exists, boom, that exists, boom, that exists. There's no proof to say that evolution is fact. This sometimes causes tremendous embarrassment because these people want to believe that something isn't true, but they can't find the proof for it. I'll be covering more about this in part two.